Listen, I don't know if the story actually began there. It probably didn't, but I know that the pain did. At that time, I was five years old and spending part of my summer vacation in the city where my mom grew up. One night, my mom and my uncle had decided to take me and my sister to the local fun fair. When we were walking home, my left leg started to hurt me, and it was an unfamiliar kind of pain. So I did what every normal child would do in such a situation. I complained and cried. And lucky for me, my uncle decided to carry me on his shoulders all the way back home, making this the last memory I have of him, as he passed away a year after that. The pain never really went away, and in the fall of 2008, we found out. On this day, 13 years ago, my story officially began. It was a cold Monday afternoon. And as I was sitting in kindergarten, I noticed something odd. My left leg was extremely swollen, and my five-year-old brain thought that my left leg was just fatter than the other one. Back at home, I was attending to lose some weight in just that one leg by swinging back and forth on a pink Disney princess gymnastics ball. As my mom was cleaning the kitchen, she saw me moving around like an idiot and asked me what I was doing exactly. When I told her, she put down the things she was carrying and sat down next to me and started asking further questions. The fact that it was 6 p.m., dad wasn't home yet and that she didn't own a car did not stop her from taking me to the hospital. Good thing my godfather Nachli was nearby to take us both. In the hospital, they took an x-ray of my legs and for some reason it took them three hours to figure out that there was something wrong with it. But you know what made it worth the wait? a golden Christmas book filled with some pretty cool Disney characters. Not gonna lie, I had a pretty good time. Although, I did not quite understand why the nurse said that I could keep the book, or why everyone was so concerned. After the long wait, the doctor said that it might be a more serious problem, and that it might be a better idea to go to the children's hospital. Honestly, I never understood the meaning of all those medical terms, and I couldn't tell you what they exactly were. So, I took the liberty to ask my former doctors. Du warst noch ein ganz kleines Mädchen und bist dann an einem bösartigen Knochentumor, im sogenannten Osteosarkom, von dem Oberschenkelbereich, der relativ nah am Knie liegt, erkrankt. Was du zusätzlich noch hattest, waren einzelne Lungenmetastasen, also dass der Tumor eigentlich auch in die Lunge gestreut hatte. Yeah, they did not quite tell me the story that way. Although I can't really remember them explaining anything to me anyway, I remember me using the terms they used in this book. Chemo Casper. The solution to the problem was basically illustrated. Chemotherapy. I had root cells, aka cancer, and only the Chemo Casper and his doppelganger gang knew how to defeat them. But of course that would only happen if I did chemotherapy. So why should I be scared of something that had a solution? They said it could be fixed, so I believed it. Back then I never took chemotherapy failing me or dying in consideration because they simply didn't list that as an option.
Grundsätzlich sind, sind Knochentumore natürlich selten bei Kindern, kommen aber typischerweise eigentlich später vor, so in dem Alter um die Pubertät rum, wenn der Hauptwachstumsschub ist, so mit 12, 13, 14 und du warst wirklich sehr, sehr jung für diese, dieses Osteosarkom. Und das stellte sich dann auch im weiteren Verlauf wirklich als Problem heraus. At that time, we had several issues to face. Um, of course, it was the age. The age means that uh, there is a lot of growth left for, um, for, for the skeleton. Uh, therefore, we had the first option to perform a rotation plastic. But um, I remember well the discussion we had. I still think of the mother. Uh, for her, this was uh, completely impossible. Uh, so. Right away she urged me to do something else and I remember I was really mm, depressed because uh, I was convinced um, uh, every, every other option is doomed to failure because uh, if you use a prosthesis that's um, just a long way to go. You have to adapt uh, the leg to growth. Um, infection is a huge problem. But nevertheless we had many many discussions and in the end uh, I jumped over my, over my shadow and um, we implanted a, a growing prosthesis. Uh, I never did a growing prosthesis in a patient uh, at six years, which is basically insane, right? But um, at that time I felt that, you know, if the family is so much committed and Vanessa for sure too, um, well, then let's give it a try. And so we chose uh, to implant the growing prosthesis even at that young age and even you know, embedded in chemotherapy. Du hast wirklich eine sehr intensive Chemo erhalten, hast erstmal zehn Wochen Chemo bekommen, sofort nachdem wir wussten, dass du an einem Osteosarkom leidest. Dann ist der Tumor erst operiert worden. Das ist ganz wichtig, um gesund zu werden, dass er komplett rauskommt. Und nach der Operation hast du noch mal eine intensive Chemo bekommen über weitere, jetzt muss ich schauen, tatsächlich 30 Wochen. If you uh, implant the growing prosthesis at this young age, the entire leg does not grow equally at the same speed as the opposite side. And this uh, concerns the entire leg, not only just let's say the femur uh, or just the thigh bone, the, the leg bone but also the foot and uh, sure enough uh, Vanessa then developed a, a different size of the feet. What uh, we then did is we applied the same method to the leg meaning let's say we, we, we cut the, the leg bones, uh, we inserted a nail into the bones and this nail had also a motor with the capacity to grow inside. So we cut the bone, put the nail in, we locked it uh, proximally and distally and then we, we extended the leg bone uh, over the next few months and uh, I think we, we, we let grow uh, some five centimeters plus of the leg uh, bone uh, so that in the end the leg was again the same length and the knee joints were the same level. أنا كنت بس حس حالي هيك ما عندي قوة وكذا أطلع فيك وقول إذا فانيسا اللي هي المرض فيها وعم تقدر تكون بهالقوة ليش أنا ما بدي كون قوية كنت أخذ القوة عن جد مني وقول أنا خايفة عليها وليك هي كيف أخذتها بكل بساطة بكل طبيعية My mom always tried to be by my side She would ask for an extra mattress to spend the night at the hospital just so that I wouldn't be alone, and she only bought a car to drive me around. There was just that one time where I had, well, something serious besides cancer, and therefore I had to spend one night in the intensive care unit. Of course, mom couldn't stay for long, but as usual, I had no idea. I could have sworn that she was there right before I fell asleep, but when I woke up at 2am, she just wasn't there. No one was. For the first time in my life, 
I was all alone. The sound of crying children filled the air, along with the sound of beeping machines, a few nurses, and some small and weakly shining lights. I called the nurse. I probably said something like, I want my mommy. So at some point she pulled out the phone, dialed my house number, and gave me the phone to talk to my mom. I wasn't used to her not being around me. Or no one being around me. Honestly, there wouldn't have been a single smile on my face in that time if it hadn't been for my family. Just seeing them, I felt happy. Knowing that they were around me, supporting me, and not leaving me alone, that really gave me strength. A moment which I will never forget, of course, was um, the first visitation I made during, uh, after surgery. Um, you know, you have to imagine, you cut a huge piece of the leg from a six-year-old girl. I mean, this, this hurts, of course. Then you think of the parents because, you know, you're, maybe yourself, you're also a parent, and then you have completely different emotions. It's also difficult to control. I was figuring out, you know, how Vanessa might react when we come in and uh, what she will say. And, um, you know, I was prepared to, you know, to go through a storm. To be honest, I was just pissed. Next morning, I, uh, I remember, like it was yesterday, um, went to the room and um, Vanessa was sitting there in her, in her bed. And in front of her was a TV. After 16 hours of surgery and 12 hours of sleep, all I really wanted to do was just to have breakfast while watching something on TV. The only problem I had was that there were no children channels. Okay, yeah, they did have Kika, but like, seriously, Kika? It's like cancer was just not the right way to torture me. After going through each and every channel and realizing that they indeed had nothing to offer but crap, I became super pissed. Then I was realizing Venice was all focused on her, her TV. At some point I just gave up and stared at the TV in anger. I started to, to ask her, well, how is it going, no, is it, what about what pain and so on. My response, well, not good. They don't have Super RTL. What am I exactly supposed to watch now? The reaction that this little girl at that time expressed was just, um, you know, just uh, uncountable. Oh yeah, right, Minecraft popcorn also exists. I totally forgot about that. It's not that I don't eat popcorn. I mean, I do, just not Minecraft popcorn. I mean, not to brag or anything, I do make awesome popcorn, but that's not the point right now. As soon as visiting hours were over at the children's hospital, my mom would make microwave popcorn, push together our beds, while I put on the Mr. Bean cartoon. We would just sit there, eat popcorn and laugh about Mr. Bean's clumsiness. Of all those hospital memories, that one's my favorite. Another milestone in then was, you know, when the moment came uh, when we had to make the prosthesis grow. You know, at that time we did not have too many experiences because this was all new and this basically was the first time where you could put a magnet there on a receptor and then it, uh, the motor inside uh, got the signal and then it grows. And uh, of course, we had no clue how, you know, does that hurt, um, how does the patient react and um, you know, nevertheless we have to try it in a in a, in a six-year-old girl. Finally, the day came where we had to do it. Um, not knowing what we were facing, we were asking ourselves in the team, you know, how, how do we you know, deal with uh, Vanessa? I just asked for ice cream and Nachle bought one for me and one for himself. I was about halfway through my ice cream cone when they were finally ready and called us in. I would never throw away ice cream. That's why I just continued eating it while they were doing their job. With one eye, we were uh, facing Vanessa and see how she reacts. And it, it was so funny. I mean, it was just hilarious. And just the, the face expression. This might just seem to you like a piece of golden cardboard with some silly drawing on it. But to me, it's my free pass to ditching every uncool thing there is. Although this one is just a metaphorical card, there is also an actual card. May I present the handicapped card. With this card, I can be a total asshole and just not pay for parking spots. Disneyland, I got in for free. 
the Louvre Museum, free entrance baby, the castle of Versailles, I just had to show them my cancer card, and those suckers let me in, Europa Park, well okay I got 16% off but still, I mean, I was allowed to cut in line, I mean since it's not bothering me that much, why not just use it to my advantage? At this point you might be wondering why I can't bend my leg, and if this whole prosthesis situation even hurts. To answer the first question, the doctors don't even know why I can't bend my leg. And for the pain part, well, it's not the entire leg that gives me the will to kill myself. No, just two screws and one sensor do the magic. Usually I just feel the lower screw making her way through my flesh. But sometimes, when I walk more than I normally do, her sister, the upper screw, joins in on the torture process. And when life just wants to slap me even harder than it already did, the sensor chimes in. Fun fact, after the bone healed, those three items became completely useless. Look, I actually didn't used to be scared of surgeries. Heck, I wasn't even scared of cancer. Pain? Eh, sometimes, but also not that much. Dying? I mean, I was a child, so how much does a child actually think about dying? I wasn't scared because I thought it was just a phase and that it would eventually end. But as I grew older, I started thinking more about what had happened to me. You know when I realized that I could have died? When I was 12. Great timing, because then I had that third leg surgery. By the way, I had six surgeries in total and only three of them were performed on my leg. Anyway, I was pretty convinced that I was going to die this time, just because I saw it as a possibility. The morning of my surgery, I was panicking. When the anesthesia finally started to kick in, my body was feeling heavy. I had the hardest time lifting my head. They transported me to the surgery room. Mom walked with us. Tears were streaming down my face. Mom had to stop before the surgery room door and as she waved goodbye, it shut close. The room had an icy atmosphere and was lit with cold toned lights. A doctor looked down on me, felt someone else injected something that felt like a needle right in my thigh. They asked me to move to the surgery table, my body as heavy as ever and not helpful with the moving part at all. Although the lights were getting brighter, my vision darkened. Next thing I know, I was out. Of course I woke up, and a few days after the surgery, on one afternoon, I was alone in the hospital. I had been reading a book when I realized that it was snowing outside. I laid the book down put on some music and turned my attention to the outside world. It was beautiful watching the snow covering the whole city in white. But this made me realize just how much I was tired of staying in place and not being able to move properly. I wanted to go outside. Seeing everyone around me walking, running or just standing while I couldn't move just gave me the desire to be normal again, to do whatever they could. I had that once. I had been able to do all that. And now, now i just forgotten what it feels like. When I walk, people stare at my leg. Sometimes complete strangers ask me why I walk like that. I still get picked up from school, although I only live five minutes away and for me it's just embarrassing. Sometimes I feel trapped in my own disability and can't do anything about it. Why do I have to be stared at while walking? Why am I always the one to be left behind when walking in groups? Why can't I use the stairs like a normal person without feeling like a complete idiot afterwards? Why is it always painful when I walk? Why is everyone giving me the feeling that I'm being left out? And why did no one notice my cancer earlier? Would my life be any different if they had? Sometimes I wish I had leukemia instead. Then at least I wouldn't have had to be reminded of what I had to go through every day of those past 13 years. At first I thought I was okay with it, but as I get older, 
and as everyone points it out, I just realized that this whole shit straight up sucks. I know I should be thankful for still having my leg. I mean, don't get me wrong, I am, but sometimes it's just really hard to be. I just don't necessarily want to worry about having pain every day of my life. Just for once, I would like to feel normal again. Walking without having to actively think about how I should walk. Walking without having to worry about the pain that comes with walking too much. Walking without anyone staring at my leg and living with the memory and not the souvenir that cancer brought me. For the most part of my life, I've tried to make the best out of my situation and always look at the bright side. I've tried to laugh about it, joke about it, use it to my advantage. But at the end of the day, I'm left with the pain. <sighs>